The series is called This Must Be Stronger Than That. It comes from the experience of Dietrich Bonhoeffer having this deep burden of what was happening to the church in Germany. They were restricting the opportunity to preach Jesus, to live as Christians and have your belief in the Bible and practice those beliefs. This burdened him and he didn't want to recoil or stop his pursuit of God in the presence of God. As a result, he started what we would call an underground seminary. This is where he called a group of people to be radically dissimilar to culture. The spiritual formation of that experience was intense. A friend of his came to visit, spent three days watching the schedule, watching the intensity of of the pursuit of God, and he even said, this seems to be too radical for me. So Dietrich Bonhoeffer invited his friend into a boat. They rowed across a river, climbed a hillside, and looking over that hillside, he showed his friend the Nazi troops that were in formation being prepared to lead what would be the cruelest society that the world had known. He said, as you look at that, you see that Hitler is making disciples according to the Nazi vision." He then pointed back to his seminary. And as he did, he said this historical statement that creates our series. He said this, pointing at those believers, must be stronger than that. And the point was not that he was preparing to fight physically. He was saying spiritual formation must be stronger than this cultural formation that is happening. And I believe that that resonates today, here and for us. And I want to pastor us about the importance of our moment and the importance that right now spiritual formation must be stronger than cultural formation. And the reason my hopes are high is because the power of God in us is greater than the power that is at work around us. The reason... I have a deep-seated faith about this moment is because throughout time, God has always proven to honor the heart of the faithful with miracles, with blessing, with favor. Even if they were suffering, he still made a way. And let me, let me pastor us through this moment. And today we're going to allow the scripture in Daniel 3 to speak loudly and clearly. This is where King Nebuchadnezzar had apprehended many believers, kidnapped them basically, and had brought them into Babylon. The goal was to turn them into cultural Babylonians. By the time you get to Daniel 3, he has built a golden image. Imagine 90 feet high, nine feet wide, pure gold. And he said, when you hear the sound of music, you will bow to this image. And as a result, you are bowing, here are his words, to the gods, gods, plural, to the gods of Babylon. Now, historians tell us that there would have been some 300,000 people And so at the sound of the music, 300,000 bow, but three continued to stand. You may know who they are. You may have been around this story for, for your entire life. This may be new to you. But you're gonna see the courage of three who were willing to stand while everybody else was bowing because what was in them was stronger than what was around them. You're gonna see how this was stronger than that. And if it was true then, the same God that was working over the plains of Dura, the same God who was at work in the heart of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is at work in this room. And so my faith is strong that if we yield, surrender, and walk in the fear of God, we too can stand while so many others are bowing. Let me encourage us to see, starting at verse 13, 
Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Skipping to the second part of verse 15. If you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, in the Hebrew, that is three words, but if not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Put yourself as much as you can in this moment because we have the, the hindsight. We know how this is going to turn out. It, it may not be as easy to think how much tension there had to be in that moment. When they're watching everyone else bow, they see the furnace, they hear the command, they know the result, and yet they're still declaring their honor, their, their honor of God, their faith in God regardless. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious. He was furious with them, and his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual. This just show you, shows you his rage. Because, you know, at level one, fire's going to consume you. But he turns it up seven times hotter to give illustration of kind of the rage that was in his own heart toward them. He commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, they fell into the blazing furnace. So the guys trying to throw them in, the heat was so intense, it killed them. And now you have these young men in this fire. Verse 24. Then King Nebuchadnezzar, since he had backed off to a safe distance, still able to see what was happening, leaped to his feet in amazement, and he asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw in the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around, walking around in the fire. Notice the description, unbound and unharmed. And the fourth, here's Nebuchadnezzar talking, looks like a son of the gods. He's close. He's seeing the son of God. This was an Old Testament visitation of Jesus Christ. Can you give God praise that this is stronger than that? Stronger than the king, stronger than the fiery furnace, stronger unbound and unharmed, walking around, and Jesus right there in the furnace with them. I want to preach, teach through this because it is so for this hour that we're living. I want to come right at this with point one, and it's the fear of God empowers you, it empowers us against the fear of persecution. We don't have to fear persecution if we have established Jesus as the Lord of our heart, the Lord, the King, the Sovereign, God of gods. 
I fear him and I fear him alone. The fear of God is standing in awe of God. The fear of God is not being afraid of God, but it is having, having this singular honor, respect, reverence for God and then a resolve that he alone would have your allegiance from your heart of your devotion of your one and only life. The first two of the Ten Commandments are, you should have no other gods before me, and number two, make no graven image. And if we live those two, we will also live out the other eight. You can't live out the other eight unless you establish that God is God of your life, not tacked in. He is Lord. He is King. He is in control. He calls the shots. He sets the agenda. He sets the schedule because he's in control. He's God. And the fear of God empowers you to be fearless in the face of persecution. Persecution. There are a few phases of persecution. I want to talk about them. Persecution starts out with vilifying. And I feel like I want to be really careful here to pass her through this. Let me just ask you to look at that, but then consider. Nebuchadnezzar said, you've got to bow to this golden image. And it didn't represent a God, but God's pluralism. So he's saying to these young men that honored God, you, you can have your God privately, but when you come into the public arena, you're going to bow like everybody else. So you send the message that you know and believe that your God's not the only God. And the way we are assimilated into the ways of culture is that culture believes that over time we will quit resisting. And as we quit resisting, we are forgetting the exclusive claims of Scripture that we've stood on as not, not our truth or my truth, but the truth. Let me, let me teach us through this. When you, when you walk in a fear of God, He is God, He is Lord of your life, and you represent the truth of Scripture, you will be vilified. Some of you may be experiencing this right now. Here's the way it comes across. You mean you believe that? You mean you're that narrow-minded? How can you be that intolerant? That's not even loving. Actually, that's bigoted. Phase two, marginalizing. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the one sent of God, the one who took on the form of a servant, the one who gave his life, satisfied the holiness of God, paid the price of sin, defeated Satan, and opened up a way whereby anybody who cries out can be saved, that's fine. But I also believe in God, but I have another way to God. So don't come with this exclusive claim that he's the only name given whereby we must be saved and how we experience eternal life. Marginalized. So it's the effort of privatizing our faith. You can believe what you want, but keep it at your home. Keep it in your heart or keep it in this church. We'll let you have a corner, but you're not going to be mainstream. You're going to be marginalized. We're going to privatize your faith. So you see the extraction of any vestige of Christianity from so many public arenas, schools, businesses, but now there is an effort to extract it. And the privatization of our faith is this, just don't promote, give witness to, or preach the exclusive claims of Scripture. Number three, criminalizing. And this is where there will be more and more legislation presented and passed 
to take away religious freedom. This is where you will see more and more lawsuits that are filed against the church for taking a position of biblical truth. Now, let me just pastor us through this. If we begin that we fear God above all else, then we don't care if somebody puts us on blast because we believe in the exclusive claims of Scripture. Number two, we don't get threatened by privatization because we are light and we are sought. And if we walk in a fear and awe of God, a passion for God, then like the disciples in the book of Acts who were told, shut up, privatize your faith, they said, not in arrogance, but in passion. We can't help but tell all the words of this life. If you know that Jesus Christ is sent of God, is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, the one and the only one worthy to die in our place to forgive our sins, who has passed through the heavenlies and has sat down at the right hand of the Father. If you know that every other religion is false and leads to despair, cannot answer the need of the human heart or the human experience. If you know that is Jesus, then you won't be able to help but just give witness to who you know made you, saves you, secures you, blesses you. And so we will not be afraid of being vilified or marginalized and let laws be passed, let lawsuits be filed. The Word of God will stand the test. See, we don't have to defend ourselves. God can defend Himself. Just honor God. Live for God. Let everybody else bow. You keep standing. Come on. This whole text is about worship. <clears throat> Who will you worship? You will bow down. You will bow down and worship the gods. He's not even asking them to quit believing. He's just saying, quit believing it's exclusive. Which is the way culture assimilates us and we become more like the culture than the Christians we are saved to be because over time we quit resisting and we forget what anchors our soul, which is the truth of Scripture. Let me encourage us. Go back from Genesis to Revelation. God is creator. God is redeemer. God made us. He made male and female. That's it. Marriage is between a man and a woman in the covenant ordained by God. Biblical sexual ethics are exactly the way the scripture presents. There is one name, only one name, there's not even a close second whereby you must be saved. It is Jesus Christ with the world behind me and the cross before me. I'm gonna live for God. Though none go with me, still I will follow. God is looking for a church that will stand while everybody else is bowing and the fear of God, he's God and God alone, will empower us to be fearless against persecution. Come on, I can tell you wanna give God an affirmation that you're gonna stand, that you're gonna live for him, that you're gonna honor him, you're gonna be sanctified and set apart as unto God. Holy Spirit, come today. Holy Spirit, put fire in our heart greater than the fire. Okay. Can I shout it today? This right here is stronger than that. Put praise right there. This is stronger. I, I do, I do, I do, I do want you fired up. I, I want to be inspirational, but I, I want to make disciples out of this message and out of this series. I want to make disciples. I want to make men and women that will serve God no matter what, that will look the devil right in the eye and say, I'm not bowing. I'm not bowing. I trust him. I believe him. I'm going to live for God. And so I just want to say out loud, we are people who do not have a reversible jersey. 
I'm not going to be one thing here and be something else tomorrow. Come on, church. I'm not going to be, that's the compromising church of Revelation. That's the lukewarm church of Revelation. Fundamentally, they lost the fear of God. Come on. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Whew. Number two, as the heat gets turned up, well, as a matter of fact, let, let me show you something. Take me to Matthew. This is message paraphrase. Stand up for me against the world opinion. I'll stand up for you before my Father in heaven. He's my advocate. He's my attorney. He's my God. He's my Savior. He's my sovereign. And he says he'll stand up for me if I stand up against world opinion. Take that to heart. As the heat gets turned up, there will be suffering. So I want to say that suffering relates to character like fire relates to gold. That suffering is to your character as fire is to gold. The, the gold that's put in the fire, that's an intense experience, but it purifies, it makes better. And Peter writing to a bunch of Christians who were under some some persecution, the heat was being turned up. He said, look, it don't, don't get confused or taken back by the fiery trial that you're going through because it, your faith is going to be like the gold. Just like the gold is purified, your faith is going to be strengthened. You're going to come out of this better. You're going to come out of this stronger. Watch this. Nothing like suffering helps me to know what's really in my heart. Then when I go through suffering... Nothing like that helps me to be more compassionate. That suffering and, and walking through a hard time gives me compassion for others who are walking through a hard time. Going through a difficult time but trusting God then deepens that trust to where I know, I know, I know. I'm not just saying he's trustworthy. I know he's trustworthy. And so it doesn't matter if the heat gets turned up the same God who's been faithful, the same God who's brought me through, I know, regardless of what circumstance are saying, I know God will be faithful, so I trust him. Suffering, suffering refines that within us. So I want you to see this. Suffering will relate to your character like fire relates to gold, so you can be better. But you will only be better if like these three young men, you love God for God, no strings attached. You don't love God with an agenda. In, in my life, I'm 57 now. It hurts to say that. Like, it does. I just can't even believe it. Dear God, that's halfway to what, 114? Methuselah is soon to be your pastor. <laughs> the oldest dude in the Bible. So, growing up as a, as a kid and then a teen teenager in church, there was never a time where the, the flow of teaching and preaching removed suffering from the human experience. It just always said, God's going to be faithful. There will be hard times. Like, we were taught... In this world, you're going to have, the word was tribulation. It's a big Bible word for, it, it will get hard at times. But somewhere along the way, something happened to where when they're suffering, we either think there's something wrong with us or something's wrong with God. Because if I could fix something, I wouldn't suffer. Or if God was actually good, like everybody says he is, then I wouldn't be suffering. And so many people who once were in church and loving and serving God are not today because of, of how, how they struggle with God's relation to them and suffering, like what he didn't do and the prayers he didn't answer. And so let's just have real talk. They loved God with an agenda. God, I love you if you respond in this way. 
And these three young men show us that they love God for God. They have full faith in God and his ability to literally keep them from the fire. Number two, to keep them through the fire. Watch this. And if none of that, like, see, they weren't standing for God because of what he would do. They were standing for God for God. Here's what this means. Like I'm praying for a complete healing and God is really helping me and I'm on my way. And I have full faith that he can do it and he will do it, but he hasn't done it yet, but I still love him. And if he doesn't do it this side of heaven, I still love him. I prayed for people who have cancer and God has healed them along with the church who was praying for them. I prayed for others with cancer and they went on to be with Jesus. You know what I think? Both got healed. You with me? See, some people don't like this. But the wisest man, Job said, or Job, not the wisest man, that was Solomon. Job said, suffering will rise like sparks rise. It's just going to happen. Suffering will come. Here's the thing. You're going to get healed because he will save you from it or through it. Come on, like let, let, this, let this challenge you for a bit. This, this isn't me going, well, I guess he's, no, he's a healer, he's a deliverer. If you've got a family issue and you need it fixed, God can do it. But if he doesn't, keep loving God. If you've got a financial issue and you need God to intervene, God can intervene. But if he doesn't, keep loving God. We didn't get into this for what he will do, we got into this for who he is and what he's done so that we could be saved. Just, let I me mean, pastor us through, you know, man, let, let, me, let me ask you, come on, get in the boat, come across cultural waters, climb the hill of our cultural moment. Look over. We're being vilified and marginalized and, and, and there's, there's more legislation being passed and more lawsuits being filed. I, I've come under the scrutiny of of a situation like that for just standing for biblical truth. Do you realize the way I'm preaching today is soon going to be deemed as hate speech? That's the deception that is working. I'm preaching what will give you life, fulfillment, deliverance, peace, identity, and eternal life in a full place called heaven. And yet culture is going to say it's bigoted and hateful and, and I can be ultimately sued. Look over the hill. That's what's happening. Look over the hill, and you'll see that Satan is trying to disciple believers away from faith in God for God to faith in God for what he does. And when he doesn't do it just like we want, we pack up and we go home. And, and then we, we get angry. Listen, we get angry at God. In this world, there will be trouble. There will be suffering. But he has overcome the world. And here's Isaiah 43. When you establish him as God, when you pass through the flames, you will not be burned. And so it is possible to go through suffering and get better like gold being refined. But you have to honor and love God for God. That's it. And the, the book of Hebrews chapter 11, it lists these great heroes of the faith. And you'll read about Noah. He wasn't saved from the flood. He was saved through the flood. These three guys, along with Daniel, they had to go through Babylon. Daniel had to go through the lion's den. He suffered. They passed a law saying he couldn't talk to God. And Daniel's like, a life where I can't pray is not a life I'm interested in. These three guys, along with Daniel, do you know why all of the leaders are gathering around and watching these three guys? Because they were governmental leaders. They were in the mainstream, and they had influence. Daniel was second only to the king when it came to authority, when it came to mainstream influence. And these guys were great citizens, 
making a difference and exerting their influence for God by the way they live and what they would say, what they would do and what they would not do. But when certain lines were drawn by the king, Daniel would say, I'm not crossing that line, no matter what. And if you want to look at me as not a good citizen, so be it. I'm going to be a great Christian before I'm a great citizen. If you see me as not being a great citizen because I'm taking a stand for biblical claims, then I've made up my mind I'm going to be a great Christian. Now, so be it that we can be both. But when lines are drawn, I just want to tell you that the Bible is clear, and I couldn't be more passionate about the sanctity of life, and there are no ifs, ands, buts about it. I don't care how they try to frame the conversation. There is the sanctity. There is the dignity of life. I don't care how they try to normalize transgender, lesbianism, uh, homosexuality. I don't care how they try to normalize it. It will never catch the believer with the lack of clarity because we know what the Bible says. You buy into that, you will be led on a path that ends in destruction and more chaos, more confusion, more emotional broke. You'll come back with less of yourself. Come on, set your feet in the foundation of the Word of God. Young people, don't you, your friends are going to say, you, you mean you believe that I can't love somebody like this? I feel this the way you've, no, we aren't led by feelings. You've got a culture that wants to make feelings the leader. And that's how we've arrived at your truth and my truth and his truth and her truth. When they're your feelings, they're going to lie to you for the rest of your life. Your feelings are real, but they're not always true. Your heart is can deceive you. Yield to God, the Word of God, the clear Word of God, and you'll be strong. You'll be free. You'll be productive. You'll be blessed. You may suffer, but you'll get better. Put praise right there. I feel a grit, a gritty Christianity, a Christianity that's not going to back up. Jesus shows up in the fire. Jesus shows up. He shows up. And here's what I think. If you think about the omniscience and omnipresence of God, if I go to say, well, imagine if God had this calendar and somewhere in the not too distant future, I'm going to have a fiery furnace, but God's got on his calendar to meet me there. Well, here's the thing. He's already there. Because He's already in every day of my future because he's omniscient and he's omnipresent. He never has to show up anywhere. This Jehovah Shammah is not the God who shows up. It's the God who's there. See, when Nebuchadnezzar goes, how many we throw in the fire? Three. I see four. The fourth one was always there. He just didn't see the fourth one because Jesus never has to show up. I've wondered, hey, I need you to show up. And then I hear this through, through, through my life. God's never early. He's never late. He's always on time. To me, he's been late. Uh, you, you know what I'm saying? The human experience makes you feel like he's late. But if he's late, he's still on time. But here's the, here's the real truth. Above all those little phrases and saying, he never shows up anywhere. He's already there. So if there's any furnace of suffering that I have to go through because of my faith, I'll never have to pray, Jesus, I need you now. I just need to be aware. He's already there. My God. He brought three out of the fire because the fourth man stayed for those who would have to come through the fire themselves as they stand for God. There's no God like our God. Hallelujah. Oh, I got to read it. Verse 26, Nebuchadnezzar, he approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants. Now notice, he was so enraged, he turns the fire up. He's so mad. But now he's like, servants of the most high God. Come out. Come here. So they came out of the fire. And the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. 
they saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their heads singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Hey, you, worship team, you can, you can come. You know if you are around the fire for any length of time, you smell like what? Babylon. <laughs> see, here's what I want you to see. The only thing Babylon put on them is the only thing the fire burned off of them, the ropes. And though they were in Babylon, they were not of Babylon. There was something so magnificently different. There was something of such power that their clothes were unharmed, their bodies were unharmed, their hair wasn't singed, and they didn't even smell like smoke. Scripture says they're walking around. I've thought about that. When they were walking around, and it says unharmed and unbound, I wonder what they were saying to each other. I don't know. You have Jesus and these guys, and I, I wonder if, if they're just amazed at the power of Jesus as they are in these flames, and they're, they're fine. I wonder if, it, if Jesus is saying, well, way to be faithful. Way to stand. Way to go. All I know is that when they come out of this fire, Nebuchadnezzar ends up saying, and I quote, there is no other God, singular, there is no other God who can save in this way. So if you look over the hill of our cultural moment and you see that the enemy is wanting us to bow to cultural think and quit resisting and leave exclusive claims and all this stuff. But you see in this text that there is a God who will meet us in the fire. And they were unbound, unharmed. Their clothes weren't scorched, their hair not singed, they didn't smell like smoke, their body was, were not harmed. And even the king said in front of all of these leaders and all of these people, there is, there is no other God who can save in this way. There is no other God who can save in this way. To me, Nebuchadnezzar is saying, this is more powerful than that.